care of. All right, uh, take your Bible, if you will, please. We talked this morning about the blood. Why is the blood important? And we talked about some doctrinal issues in this morning, but uh, that seems to be one of those kind of things that people don't take uh, very seriously anymore. It doesn't really matter what you believe. You just do whatever you want to do, and, and, uh, but, but not here. Hebrews chapter number 9, if you want to stand, you're certainly welcome to do so. We talked this morning... Uh, as I said, the lady had asked me why the blood was important, and I gave you a few things. I showed you this morning that it redeems. I gave you the passages. It justifies. I gave you the passages. You're made nigh through the blood. I gave you the passages. It gives you peace. That's the one that we left off, and I'm talking about dying peace. Uh, the push comes to shove. When it comes time for you to kick off, that'll, you'll find out how good your relationship with Jesus Christ is. A lot of things are done nowadays and people don't really take it serious until the time comes that they're either critically ill, like Miss Daniels was telling you about, or they come time for them to cross over, you'll find out real quick that they're not, they don't really believe everything they said they believed. A lot of times they jump ship because they realize they're fixing to cross to the other side. I wouldn't want to cross to the other side knowing I'd cross the book. And I don't ever want anybody to think that, well, I make uh, compromises when it comes to the book. Whoso loveth mother or father, sister or brother, husband or wife, yea, his own children also, cannot be my disciple. There's a dividing line. What's the dividing line? It's the book. That's where your doctrine comes from. If you don't have that, you have nothing to stand on. Then what happens is you become your own authority. That's a dangerous thing to do. Now, I believe in everybody being able to choose what they want to choose, but I want to make sure that nobody disassociates or misassociates me with the wrong individuals. We believe the Bible here. We believe the Bible is the authority in all matters of faith and practice. Amen. All right, so not only does it give you peace when it comes time to die, but it also purges. Look in Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews 9, verse number 14, we'll say this and pray. How much more shall the blood of Christ, not just any blood, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Uh, Brother Mitch, you pray and ask God to bless the message, would you please? Amen. Uh, Take your Bible, if you will, please, while you're looking there and come to the book of Acts. It'll purge your your conscience from dead works. You know, I found this about a lot of people. A lot of people keep dragging you to your past life. A lot of people, when you make a mistake, the brethren never seem to forget it, and they make you pay for it forever and forever and forever. When the Lord, when you come to the Lord and He purges you, He purges your conscience from dead works, meaning things that are not worth anything. The blood of Jesus Christ says, look, I put that behind me. Don't let that hold you back from doing something in the future. I believe God can use anybody that's willing. He'll reward your willingness if you're willing to do it. But I think it has to be done within the parameters of the Bible. There's a qualifying thing there to that. You don't just get to keep on, keep on, keep on and ignoring your sin. You have to come to God and be truly sincere about it. In Acts chapter number 27, you know what happens here, I'm sorry, 26. Acts chapter 26, the Apostle Paul, you all know this story, uh, he gets ready to speak for himself and the first thing he's accused of is stuff that he did several years before. Paul's getting ready to die here in this passage. It's not long before he's on a boat to Rome and then he stops off at the island of Melita over there and then after the island of Melita he goes over and then writes 2 Timothy shortly thereafter where in 2 Timothy he said, I'm now ready to be offered and henceforth to lay to me a crown of righteousness for all those that love is appearing. That passage there. He runs through that entire thing there because he's now ready to be offered. You say, at the end of his life, all they remembered is the mess that he made in the beginning. If you look in Acts chapter number 26, he said, I made, I'm think myself happy, and so on and so forth. They ask him about it. He says, my manner of life from, from my youth, verse 4, which was at among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, from the time he was born. If they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I have lived a Pharisee. And the Apostle Paul says, and now verse number 7, I'm accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible to you that God should raise the dead? Now what happens here is the Apostle Paul is accused of killing people. He's accused of all the things that he did. And Paul never tries to defend it. 
Paul just said, listen, that's who I used to be, but that's not who I am now. I'm a different person now. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ purges you. I wish some of you would let that take place in your life. I hear a lot of times individuals come to 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. I hear a lot of individuals who made mistakes years and years and years ago, and you'd think it just happened yesterday. Some of them are sins. Okay, you sinned. You messed up. Have you asked God to forgive you? All right, then let it flush it out and let it purge you and let's move on. You may miss out on some things in life because of some things that you did, but at least you can still do something if you'll let God go ahead and do something with you. But not if you keep reminding people about everything you did. I don't know what it is about Christians nowadays, and there used to be a group that went around on a regular basis, and what they would do is, is they'd put all these people, girls and guys both, they get up in the pulpit and talk about what a whoremonger they were and what a drug addict they were and how bad they were drunk and how many times they'd been in jail and how many times they'd been in prison, and then the next one would get up and say, well, I was all that plus this, and they would one up, and the next guy would get, I was all that plus that plus this, and all it was was a way of trafficking and trash and, trash and foolishness and painting pictures in people minds out there, nothing about sin, nothing about God, nothing about, you know, well, to God be the glory. No, you're sitting there in your mind watching a television show of this individual. That Bible says, let not your good be evil spoken of. That Bible tells you that when you committed a sin against God, confess that thing to God and let the thing go. Stop going back over it and back over it and back over it. Now, here's a good testimony. I was wicked before I met Jesus Christ. I'm now wicked, but I'm saved, and I thank God for it. Well, what did you do? It's under the blood. He forgot it. I, you don't need to know about it because you won't forget it. And let's move on and talk about Jesus. Amen. That's the best kind of testimony. You say, why? Because what happens is you start trafficking all that. Then it becomes a ministry where now your ministry is connected to all your foolishness and all your mistakes and all your past. And so you got a drug ministry or you got a rehab ministry or you got a, a, a drunk ministry or whatever. I ministered to drunk. Why? Well, I was a drunk for so many years, so I understand drunks. And so I tell you all the sordid details of me hugging the toilet and puking and all that. Not me. I wasn't a drunk, but I'm, I'm, I'm using it as an illustration. Listen, when God purged you, He doesn't intend for you to keep on talking about it. Talk about how good God was and say, Hey, listen, man, I was bad enough that Jesus had to save me. That's all you need to know. Amen. Don't keep dr- hanging around and all the stuff you did. There's still things that are wrong. You still should set a standard. What you're doing is, is alibying, giving people an excuse to go ahead and say, Oh, well, that's, that's the wrong kind of an attitude. You know, well, he did it, she did it, and got back from it, so I think I'll try it. That's not the kind of individual you want up here. You don't want somebody telling you how bad you were and they made it bad. And then you know what will happen? It will tempt them to do things that are wrong. When he purges you, let him purge you. You say, what's the purging? The blood goes in and shoves all that junk out. And when it comes out, he washes it all out. Don't let it go back in there. And can I just say this? Stop living with the guilt of your sin or your mistakes or your past. He put it as far as the east is from the west like we talked about this morning. He put it in the depths of the sea. He remembers it no more. Stop reminding people about it. If you need to be humbled by it, tell God to remind you in your private prayer time. But you don't need to put that stuff in a pulpit or behind a lectern or in a Sunday school class. I've seen sometimes younger preachers, they get up and they get under pressure and stuff. And when they get to talking, all of a sudden they start bringing out sordid details about their life. Well, you just ruined your testimony. Why should they listen to you when you just told them all the stuff you did? Don't throw up on me. Everybody messes up, but if you, if you stop, let him purge you. Stop living with all the guilt. Did you confess it? Did you forsake it? Or are you still dabbling in it? Is that why you talk about it? Because your way of dabbling it is you keep playing the replays back and back and back and back in your mind. Oh, I wish for the day, I wish for the day, I wish for the day. That's why I stay away. I don't know why anybody would be searching for me. You know, who's searching for you? Who's looking for you? You're, you're a crowd you graduated with from high school. For what? Why would my high school want to be looking for me? I've been out 50 years or however long it's been, a long time. Did they even have high school when dinosaurs were on the earth? But however long ago it's been, it's been over 30-something years that I've been gone out of there, about that long, I guess, or maybe even longer than that. Why would they be looking for me? I don't want to resurrect days in high school, pimpled face, long-haired, you know, and, and doing crazy, stupid, idiotic stuff and playing ball and getting busted all up and, you know, doing this and doing that. Nothing I did back then accounts for nothing. 1970-something or another. Who, what? What? 
I was so stupid, I didn't know nothing. I was so green, you stuck me in the ground, I'd grow. Why don't I want to go back to the 70s? That ain't who I am. This is who I am now. I'm grown up now. Why y'all want to live in that stuff? I can't wait till my... One fellow just told me, he says, Can't wait till my 60th reunion. I've never seen a reunion where they're not serving liquor. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, how come you hit the, how come you hit the brakes there? Well, come on, you hypocrite. If you're going to do it, then let your kids do it. Amen. I can't come to the reunion. You say, why? Y'all are going to be sucking suds. I don't do that. Oh, well, you don't have to. You're right. I don't. I ain't coming. It tells me something about you because you're over there. What else are you going to be doing? We're going to be dancing. You ain't playing 70s tunes for me. I ain't going back to the 70s days and all that other kind of stuff and playing Happy Days or whatever was playing back then. I, I spend too much time trying to get that junk out. I can walk in Walmart. They play it and I like, I'm seeing the words. Dreaming. It's like, honey, you, you, you're a preacher. You're not supposed to. I'm like, I didn't even know I was doing that. She goes, well, you are. Shh, you know, like that. Put a sock in it, she says, you know. You get that stuff. I don't need to have that stuff reminded. And see how people turned out. Come to church. I'll see how you turned out. I need to go to a high school reunion and watch you walk around and talk about what you did and what grades you made and what you were a, a big football star or basketball star, you know, or you remember when we went out behind the building, you know, and we knocked John out and we did so and so and such and such and talk about all your wickedness and stuff like that. Not John. <laughs> but but you, you remember, and, and it's like, why? why? Well, it's fun. You've got a funny way of looking at fun. Now, I realize I'm a dinosaur. I realize what I'm saying. You're like, man, I don't, I don't really see the problem. I want to see my old friends. If they're your friends, how come they hadn't been with you for the last 50 years? How come if they're your friends, you see them once every 25 years? If they're your real friends? I don't get that. That don't make sense to me. I got people I met after I got long out of school and all of the other kind of stuff I had that are my real friends today. I don't need to go back to them fake, phony bunch of put-ons. And they'll look at me and say, is that you? You didn't look nothing like that. I guess not. I'm 35 years old or stupid. I'm not supposed to look like I did in high school. Amen. And by the way, you don't either. Amen. I know some of you guys, you think, oh, I'm going to run into my old girlfriend. For what? Right. Right. Amen. You know, well, this is my wife. This is my old flame. She must have burnt you up and burnt you out, man. <laughs> you sitting there looking at that thing to yourself. My God, what would have happened to me if I'd have married her? God's got you where you need to be. You probably wouldn't even be in church. Amen. You'd probably be lost as a golf ball in high weeds. I'm my high school sweetheart. High school so far back back then, I think cavemen were back in them days. Who cares about high school? It's something you can't wait to get out of, and then you can't wait to keep talking about going back to after you get out. When's our first reunion? Who cares? Most of us, not all of us, some of you were real good in school, but most of us did stupid things when we were teenagers. Most of us did things we shouldn't have done in high school. Most of us might not have had the greatest testimony when we were in high school. Maybe. Why do I want to remember in that? All I could do is walk in and say, well, that's what I was, but I ain't now. What do you do now? I'm a preacher. Oh. Boy, you really turned out, didn't you? You know, what do you do? I'm a Bible believer. I go to church. Oh. Yeah. We get her there. I don't even know. What were they doing? What was the dances in them? They Watusi or something? Oh, listen, listen, I'm so old back in those days. You walked in the gym floor, and what you did was you took your shoes off, and they were going to have a sock hop. So I took my shoes off and hopped across the floor like a bunny. I didn't know what that thing was, and they got this ball going around and stuff like that. And I went over to the payphone. We didn't have cell phones in those days. I called my dad. I said, I, there's something about this that ain't right. He said, where are you at? I said, I'm in the gym. He said, you playing basketball? I said, there's a bunch of people out here jumping around, the ball going around, making all kind of funny lights and stuff like that. I don't feel right here. He said, I'll be right there, boy. Just hang on. So, old preacher, that was fun. wasn't for me. I felt out of place. I mean, your dad lets you go to the sock hop? I guess he figured I'd have better sense than to get out there and hop around in my socks. I come to the door. He's standing at the door. He was a big old fellow back in those days. And he's standing at the door like this, you know, and he's, he's looking at the door. And he's not, you know, shucking the corner or nothing. I can remember a man, I mean, like the jolly green giant standing there. He filled up that whole door, and he's standing out there. And I went running over there, and I hit that floor, and I, tss, I slid up there like a kid, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, you ready to go, boy? And I said, yes, sir. He says, where's your shoes? <laughs> 
I said, oh yeah, I better get them. I didn't even take time to put them on. I grabbed them up and took off. We went to the crystal. We got, I got 10 crystals that night. I puked my brains out, man. I got 10 crystals that night and a chocolate so thick milkshake you could turn it upside down it wouldn't come out of the cup. Milkshake and them things, that little crystal with the mustard and the pickle and the onions on it. Woo! Am I talking to anybody? That white steamed bun, hallelujah. Gut balls, were they good going down, amen. They don't taste near as good coming up, but they're good going down. Hey, you can have the hot now all you want. Give me them crystals, boy. I mean, slide them over there. That that lady was back behind that cook. She'd take them things like that, put them down on there, and put them lids on there, and box them up like that. Man, you couldn't hardly wait to get them out of the box. You have to eat them before they get dry. So the faster you eat them, the better, man. And then you're waiting for that milkshake. You're finishing up. By the time we get up in the mountains and I get back home, I'm like, whoa. And <laughs> Dad says, what's the matter, boy? I said, oh, Daddy, you better get me inside. I'm going to puke. He said, you better not puke my car, boy. <laughs> you say, what, what are you talking about? High school days. Big stinking deal. I remember the first time when I was uh, in high school, I lettered when I, I, can you imagine that? I can't really chew gum and walk at the same time now. I was in the ninth grade. I lettered in JV football. Now, let me make sure I clarify this. We lived in a small town, and so if you could pretty much walk and, you know, knock somebody's head off, you lettered. You know what I'm saying? I played both ways. You say, why? Not because I was good, because there wasn't enough people to play. <laughs> and then I played basketball, because that's what they did to keep you in shape. You should have seen me. I look like Lurch or Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> you know? It's like, you want somebody taken out? Just tell Peacock. It's like, get the guy with the ball. I thought it's like football. Tackle him. <laughs> I lettered. I had me a car coat, man, and I had that big R on that thing with my little football pin, my little basketball pin. They had that little banquet. And my dad comes over to that banquet and stuff and saw me letter. My dad was a real athlete, man. He's a professional and stuff. And he, I'm over there and I'm thinking, man, ain't this something? I, I get my letter and I get in the coat. I remember my dad taking the keys of that old Thunderbird and he flipped them to me like that. And he said, hey, boy, you want to drive us home? Really? He said, sure, man. You drive us to the house. That's my memories. That's good memories of high school. I don't need no reunion for something like that. I don't need to see all that other kind of stuff. You say, what, well, preacher, you know, what's wrong with that kind of stuff? They try to remind you of your past. I did some stupid things when I was a policeman, one or two. <laughs> Listen, Miss Ex Public Defender, <laughs> arch enemy of the police, <laughs> until you got right with God, <laughs> hallelujah, and went into private practice. Because you knew you couldn't beat us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they were there to make sure you didn't railroad anybody. Really, that's the right thing to do. But I did a few things. I don't need to be reminded of that. Maybe I did one or two good things. I don't need to be reminded of that. You say, why? I give you the big head. I enjoyed it. I appreciate being there. But that's not what I do anymore. Now I enjoy being with you. I like being reunited with you every week. But one of the things I know about Christians is, is you get that burden on you and you get that feeling so guilty and the devil just lays that thing on you and lays that on you. Next time he does say, hey, the blood of Jesus Christ has purged me and everything I did that wasn't worth nothing, he's put it under the blood, so leave me alone. Amen. Secondly, for tonight, look, if you will, 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7. I'm grateful for this one right here. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7. The Bible says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Come all the way down, please, if you will. Please, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. And the truth isn't in you. The Bible says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ cleans you. Uh, that's, how, that's what you need to understand. You get clean from your own sin. Uh, what's that old song we used to sing? Praise the Lord for full salvation. God is still upon the throne. And we know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. That's a song about the blood cleaning you. 
You've heard the story about the little girl that goes out and she's got this ink pen with permanent ink in it and she opens it up with a fountain pen. In those days, you know, you draw it up out of the fountain pen and splatter it all over her dress and she got scared. She went in and got her a, a, a wash rag and she turned on the water and she's up there and she's rubbing it around and her daddy goes by and she said, I'm getting it out, daddy. I'm getting it out, daddy. No, you're not. You're spreading it all over you. It's, it's all over you. It's everywhere. You're just making the whole thing worse. Not the blood of Jesus Christ. It cleanses from ALL sin. There's nothing that you can do that God can't forgive you for. Nothing. You say, well, I'll just take advantage of that. Well, uh, let me just give you a word of caution there. You can also get the tar knocked out of you and still be saved. Ask Lot. He winds up in a cotton-picking mess over there and winds up losing his wife and his whole family and two daughters and then gets out there and winds up drunk in the cave committing incest. Cost him pretty good to be disobedient to God. You say, well, what about Samson? He wound up losing his eyes, getting stripped down naked as the day he was born, out there grinding at the mill. God wanted to use him. God wanted to use him. He wouldn't do right. He wouldn't do right. He wouldn't offer the lamb, the ram, and the he goat. And then he keeps on grinding and keeps on grinding. And he winds up in uh, captivity after he's over there laying in the bosom of iniquity and, and in Delilah's lap. And the, and the Lord tells him to quit it, quit it, and quit it. Don't touch the dead body. Touches the lion anyway. Refuses to get right. Refuses to get right. Cost him his eyeballs. Cost him his freedom cost him his clothing and he winds up dying over there when he shoves that thing down you say yeah well he killed more in his death than he did the whole time yeah but look at how he went you can lose a lot of things ladies and gentlemen after you get out of fellowship with the Lord not lose your salvation you can lose a lot of things Noah lost quite a few things that thing runs all the way through the Bible you don't want to get in there whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth that means if you step out of line and you stay out of line, if you don't get right and get back to the house, you know what you better do? You better get back to the house as quick as you can because the Lord's got a long reach. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you get in his spanking machine, he'll wear you out. You say, well, I'll just ask him to forgive me. You better get it under the blood quick and hope the consequences don't come. Amen. Don't ever misunderstand the forgiveness of sin from being removed from the consequences. Though I have to be honest in my life, there's times he's removed the consequences. There have been times in my life where I deserve to have the tar knocked out of me and the Lord was merciful and long-suffering with me. But don't take that that he means he's condoning and accepting your sin. It just means he's merciful and long-suffering. You know how that thing is. The old preacher tells you that when you get out of fellowship with the Lord and you take off running, the further out there you get, the better he has the opportunity to whip you. The thing to do is, is when you get out of fellowship with the Lord, is run back as quick as you can. And when he starts to lay on the stripes and you start seeing the stars, you run up there and grab him around the legs and stay as close as you can because it's kind of hard for him to get to you like that. You say, what does it do? It kind of breaks the fulcrum. But you get out there like that, man, I mean, he can make you do the hopscotch and the get gone, boy. But what you want to do is you get up there close. There's a great lesson in that. When you get out of fellowship with the Lord, don't keep running, stupid. He'll knock the tar out of you. Amen. When you run back to the Father's house and grab him around the legs and go ahead and take your punishment, but it won't hurt near as bad because you're right up on top of him. When I tell you the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, I'm telling you that the blood's important because that's the only way in 1 John chapter number 1 that entire passage has to do with your fellowship. If you do things and continue in sin, your fellowship with Jesus Christ is broken, but you still remain a son. The prodigal was in the pig pen for a long period of time, but ladies and gentlemen, he remained a, a, a son the entire time he was in the pig pen and while he was out there in riotous living. Look in 1 John chapter 1. Let me show you this real quick so you understand the context. This has nothing to do with salvation at all. This has to do with fellowship. It's like this. It's like the, uh, uh, years ago I worked at a, a, a gas station over off of Cessary Boulevard. I don't even know if that thing is still there. Uh, I wish I could remember that old dark-headed fellow's name. And then later on I worked at the Shell gas station on University Boulevard over there. And I, but I was over there and back in those days, I know you can find this hard to believe, gas is about 35 cents or so a gallon and the people come in there, ding, ding, and go off. And you pull up there and you went out and it was a full-service gas station. They didn't pump their own gas. You were the gas jockey. That's what they called us. And you went out there with a rag in your back pocket, and you went out there, and you know how much, and they'd say $3 worth. Well, that would give you half a tank in them days. You'd say $3 worth or whatever, and they'd give you, you know, your $3 and all that, and check the iron and the tires, they'd say. Uh, check under the hood, check the oil, check the transmission fluid and those kind of things. It wasn't complicated like the stuff Matt deals with nowadays. It was simple stuff. I mean, even a kid could do that. Show you how to check the dipstick and things like that. You need a quart of oil. Okay, 10W30, or put in high detergent, or put in whatever. They have all these little canisters of oil there and stuff. And then you had to clean the windshield. And they have you clean the windshield. 
So you get to scrubbing the windshield, and you keep noticing the spot, and you keep rubbing, and you keep rubbing, and you keep rubbing, and you keep rubbing. And the guy behind the wheel says, uh, well, listen, before you rub a hole in my windshield, the dirt is not on the outside. The dirt's over here on the inside. You need to clean out the inside. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from the inside out. doesn't mean that there won't be some consequences. That's like, it's like that. It's the inside that needs to be cleaned up on a regular basis. That's where you have your fellowship with him. Look at this passage on fellowship real quick. This is a doctrinal thing you have to grab a hold of. Verse number 3. Uh, that which have seen, uh, seen and heard and declare we unto you that also we, uh, may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship, verse number 3 continuing, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things are added to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which you've heard of Him, the declare of God is light and in Him no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Do you see that whole context of that thing has to do with fellowship? It has nothing at all to do with salvation. Now you have to rightly divide your Bible to get that. So what happens when I sin? You ask the Lord to cleanse you in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I told the sister this morning, and we were sitting over here, and I said, Sis, you mind if I sit down here? She said, No, preacher, that's fine. Have a seat. And I said, I took a shower this morning. And she said, Okay, good. I'm glad, you know, kind of joking around and stuff like that. And I said, uh, I also took a blood bath this morning. And she said, Yeah, me too. You say, Surely not. Yeah, yeah. Take a blood bath. You say, What does that mean? Lord, forgive me. I just confess the ones I know. He says, I'll take care of the rest of them. That's a pretty good deal. Amen. I'm positive I sin. I got with this braying donkey one time, this real ultra-religious, come to Romans chapter 5, this hierarchy, this I'm, I'm Mr. Perfect. I'm walking around with my nose up in the air, you know, and I'm, I'm holier than thou kind of an individual. He's always just kind of sanctified. And he, if he didn't have a Bible in his hand, he, he walked around. He'd hold his, his coat or something all the time. He just kind of floated. I was kind of wondering about him. But I, I got to talking to him one time, and I, I said to him, and I said, what about this thing about confessing your sin? He said, I don't have to worry about confessing my sin. I never sin. I thought, man, you must be the fourth part of the Trinity. And I said, you never sin? And he said, since I've been saved, I can't sin. I said, well, you just told a lie right there. How's that working out for you? But you know what he didn't do? He didn't separate from that soul and that, and that flesh. Your soul can't sin anymore. It's cut away from your body. But your flesh can sin every day. Amen. Tell me you don't need to confess your sin. You say, what? Well, God judges your thoughts. God judges you for gluttony, just like he judges you for lying. Amen. The Lord tells you, stop. And you say, no, I'm going to have another biscuit. The Lord says, you're too fat. Knock it off. Or you're too thin. Now, I'm not talking if you've got problems and issues and don't get mad at me and get all upset. And the same thing goes for any other thing that you've got going on. It's a good thing just to take a blood bath on a regular basis. And then this fellow said to me, he said, well, the way I figure it is I could never list all the sins that I'm positive I commit every day. I said, you just said you didn't sin. He said, well, I'm just saying that you know how we are. We all commit sins that we don't know. And I said, you think God's going to hold you? I quoted Romans 5 to him, or Romans chapter 7 to him. I said, or Romans 4. I said, do you really think that God's going to hold you accountable for something you don't even know you did? He says, well, you know, that's the sovereignty of God. What is that? That's just God's will that you, you don't explain, so you duck behind some big word you don't even know what it means that a Calvinist uses and that kind of a stuff. What are you ducking there for? Hey, I know I'm a sinner. What'd you do? I thought the wrong thing. God, forgive me. I got the wrong thoughts in my mind. God, forgive me. I had stuff come out of my mouth shouldn't come out of my mouth. God, forgive me. I overslept. I didn't sleep enough. That's a good one for you. God, forgive me. I didn't rest enough. Are you listening to me, chief? Uh, God, forgive me, I overworked. God, forgive me, I overdid. God, forgive me. I mean, some of it's sins of indulgence, overdoing. Just as much a sin to work too much. What's the matter? Are you insecure? Oh, I forgot. You don't want people to think you're lazy. You hearing me, Mr. Holland? You get people thinking, oh, I don't want them to think I'm lazy. That about put me in the ground. They don't care whether they think you're lazy or not. It's like, keep working hard. And when you croak, Jody will move in and take over everything. You've got to enjoy it along the way a little bit. Amen. What are you laying up more, more nuts for? You've got more than you can eat now. They'll be rotten by the time you get to them. Amen. Really, enjoy the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. But when he says about confessing your sins, you know what he says? Confess the ones you know. And he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Amen. 
So even if there was something you didn't know you did, God said, I'll take care of it. Just confess the ones you know. By the way, as I mentioned to you this morning, you did them because that's who you are. Your outward action shows there's an inward person. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you're doing that, you've got a heart issue. So it's not just, I did this. It's, Lord, this is who I am. I need to fix me. I need heart surgery. I like that old sermon years ago. The old uh, preacher, uh, oh, what's his name? Flew around an airplane with the honeybees all the time. Broloff. Broloff used to preach a song about Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And Dr. Law condemned him all the time. And his heart was black and wicked all the time and so on and so forth. And Dr. Grace came in there and opened him up and took that old black heart out and said, you're going to die and you're no good and replaced it with a clean heart and that kind of thing. Dr. Grace came in and did the surgery and, and had mercy on him for his black heart. I like that. You ought to get that sermon if you ever get a chance to listen to him preach that. He could really preach that message called Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And it shows you that all the law does is condemn you and the grace of God will forgive you if you'll confess and come to Him. That's what the confession of your sin is, to keep you in fellowship with Him. Now, if you don't want to have fellowship with Him, then don't confess your sins. That's what an altar's for. You come down here and do business with God, not just to confess your sins, but to pray for other people. That's why an altar's here. It's for people to come down here and talk to the Lord. It's for people to talk about their sin. It's still right to confess your sins even though you're saved. Well, you don't have to get resaved. Heck no, you ain't got to get resaved. We believe in eternal security. Amen. We believe once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, that's just something stupid. No, you're not, you're, you're not very uh, intelligent if you don't believe what the Bible says. He says you're sealed to the day of redemption, yes or no. Amen. Well, you either are or you're not. What's all the worrying going to do for you? Every person I've ever talked to that believes they can lose their salvation don't believe they're the one that can lose it, don't believe they can lose it for whatever sins they're committing, and they believe that for somehow or another that they're immune to this, whatever sin it would be that would cause them to lose it, but they always sort of lower the bar when it comes to themselves as far as sin is, and God doesn't really look at that, and raise the bar as to what it would take to lose it. Well, hey, man, just do what the Bible says and just accept the fact that you're sealed the day of redemption and that way you don't have to worry about it. But you need to confess your sins to stay clean. Amen. Right. And if you're not clean, you know what will happen? It'll come out eventually. It'll, it'll come out eventually. And the bad thing about being unclean is you corrupt other people. When you're unclean, you spread that corruption to other people. Does that matter to you? Apostle Paul knew that he had said some stuff he shouldn't have been saying and he corrupted a bunch of people and ruined a bunch of people and spent the rest of his life trying to straighten it out. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit doesn't tell you about it. He couldn't hold you accountable for it if you didn't. I want to try to do my best to stay clean. I didn't say I live clean. I try to. But when I mess up, I like the Holy Spirit to <clears throat> stick me in the side and say, hey boy, I'm trying to make it a habit. I don't wait till I get to church. I try right then. Lord, forgive me. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. It's a clue when the Holy Spirit and my wife are jumping on me at the same time. <laughs> and then I can't turn to her and say, thank you, Holy Spirit. It's kind of like in the mouth of two or more witnesses and the Holy Spirit's screaming in this ear and she's whispering in the other ear. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. I got it. You remember that thing I mentioned to you this morning and the thing uh, when I said there should be signs in the moon and the sun and the moon and the stars? That's the stars being out of course. That's not astrology. That's not you looking to the stars for your predictions for your horoscope. Some of you got the thing, oh, see, there's signs in the heavens. That's not for you. You've already gotten raptured out. You ain't to be looking to the heavens for your direction. You're to be looking to the Bible. You say, who does that? Devil worshipers. You look and when it comes to sin, you can look in the heavens all day and they'll say, oh, don't worry about it. You're going to meet some ni nice looking redhead today and it's going to be your day. <laughs> you spend all day looking for the redhead and then you come home and thinking, well, honey, better dye your hair or something. I don't know what the Bible said. I mean, my horoscope said I was going to meet a redhead. You know what's got to be true. <laughs> Somebody said to me one time while I'm, while I'm on it. Somebody said to me one time while I'm on that. Uh, they, they asked me, Doc, we sitting there at the table and we'll, we, uh, we go to the Sino Cat a lot of times and eat, you know, uh, uh, Chinese and stuff like that. Sino Cat. You don't see cats around a Chinese place. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nice just finally got that. Oh. 
We got our Filipino brother here today. Well, the first time I was over in the Fil second time I was in the Philippines, we had a guy over there named uh, Raymond. And uh, Raymond, there was a big wharf rat thing out there, about about as big as a cat like that. And he said uh, in broken English. Now I understand all my accents are the same, so this is not this is not this will probably sound more this will sound more Romanian than Filipino, but. Uh, or maybe German or Dutch or something. But at any rate, he said, do you eat the rat? And I said, no, we don't eat rats, man. I'm not eating no rat. He said, that rat, good eating. And I said, I ain't eating no rat. And he said, oh, you've never been hungry. <laughs> what do you have to say that for? <laughs> I said, well, I guess if I was hungry, he said, how about the balut? And I said, balut, don't be laughing, brother. I said, Baluk, that's like rotten egg down there in the ground. Or they also have what's called day old on a popsicle stick, and it's a chicken that ain't hatched out yet. He said, you eat this, make you strong like bull. I said, I be weak like kitten. I'm not eating that. He said, it is very good. And he put the whole thing in his mouth, and I'm like, oh, Hallelujah. <laughs> Preacher, what did you say all that for? Ah, to make you laugh, make you relax a little bit. But know this, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps you clean in order for you to stay in fellowship. Amen. If you want to stay in fellowship with the Lord, that's what you're doing. Well, anyway, here's the story I was telling you. We go to the, to the, to the Chinese diner. <laughs> We've got to learn to be more politically correct, I guess. We go to the, to the Sino Cat. And we're through eating, man. We've eaten everything, whatever it is. It all tastes like chicken. You know, it's got a whole, you put, you put, you put enough spice on it, it all just tastes the same. You know, Kung Pao and general chicken and mousy tongue, whatever, and all that kind of stuff. I'm always mousy tongue chicken. I'm like, ah, is that like a hint? Mousy tongue chicken, tongue chicken. All, anyway, they got all that stuff. It's all chicken. That's what they say. It's all chicken, you know. Even the Sufi would like chicken. So anyway, we eat all that stuff and everything. Well, they come around with, the, with the, uh, the, the cookie thing, the fortune cookie things, you know, and the old preacher's just sitting there clowning around with a bunch of us, and he goes, okay, boys, read them and weep, you know, and he throws them out like this, you know, <laughs> like he's throwing out a deck of cards. You know, I popped it open, man, I looked at it, and I said, oh, you know, seven, six, three, two, so, so forth, you know, he said, bingo, you know, like that. <laughs> And we laughed, and I turned it over, and it said something stupid, you know, today's going to be your day, or whatever it might be, or, or anything like that. And there was a guy sitting at the end of the table, and, and he, was, he just got all upset and everything. And so we got ready to go, and he came to church here. And he said, uh, Pastor, I need to speak with you. And I said, what's that? He goes, I, I can't believe you and Dr. Ruckman believe in horoscopes and fortune cookies. <laughs> I said, excuse me? He goes, y'all were reading fortune cookies. He said, that's just wicked. I said, Oh, brother, cut it out. We were clowning around. We certainly didn't mean to offend you. He said, you mean you don't believe that stuff? I said, brother, they take that stuff, they make the cookie and stuff them with whatever. They ain't sitting there going, oh, let's see, this will be for Peacock in 2014. Make sure it goes in cookie number 179, and that shows up at his table. I said, brother, we're just clowning around. He goes, I was just shocked that you and Dr. Ruckman read fortunes. I said, Lord, have mercy. So I said, okay, I said, I'm, I'm, I apologize to you. I didn't mean to do that. And I said, I won't do it anymore while you're around. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you may think that's not that, you know, you think, oh, now, preacher, you shouldn't be doing that and all that kind of stuff, really. If that's the worst thing I ever do, he sits there and he's, he's like, hold that bowl over there, brother. Hold that bowl over there. I said, what are you going to do? He goes, just hold the bowl. <laughs> Two points. <laughs> I said, what did your fortune say? He said, today you will make big basket. <laughs> I looked at it. It didn't say that at all. Now, now listen, that, that, that stuff that people that put their life in the hands of stars, you're a Christian. You don't put your life in the hands of stars. One day the stars are going to fall from heaven. Then what you going to do? That's what he said. All the heavens are out of sort. They're out of course. The stars are off. You say, why? Ecclesiastes says God is what's holding everything right now in orbit. You know why you don't fly off the planet? God. Amen. You know why your planet stays in orbit? God. You know why the sun stays over there and you stay over here? God. 
you know, all the planets aren't <laughs> crashing in. You say, what about asteroids hitting us? Not till God says so. You ain't got to worry about that. You got a, you got a solar shield around you. Why do you let people get you all jacked up about that? I'll say if an asteroid's going to fall, fall at 76, 75 Chipwood, man. Make sure I'm home. <laughs> Me and my dog and my wife. We all can have the mess after it's over with. But let it be quick. I don't want to be watching it fall. I just want to be sitting there, you know, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> and then be in heaven. I think that'd be cool, man. That'd be a great way to go. I thought about getting on my roof and painting a big X up there. So, you know, if Putin decides to fire a missile over here, he's like, well, we, that must be a good target. Somebody put an X on it. <laughs> Hit it, man. Pink mist. To follow after my nickname. All right, uh, Romans chapter 5. Are you there? Let me give you one more. I'm, I, I, lest I digress. Who says you can't have fun in church? We had a pretty good time this morning, didn't we? good time this morning. Singing and all was real good. Romans chapter 5. Here's the last thing I like right here. Uh, it saves. Verse number 8. But God committed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, there's a couple of salvations that you want to grab a hold of there. One is your soul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and one of it is being saved from the tribulation. Every time the Bible says saved, it doesn't mean that it's just being saved from, uh, from sin, being saved from hell, being saved eternally. Uh, look in 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, what's that song we used to sing? We used to sing it a lot of times. Uh, let me think how that thing goes. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved, and so on and so forth, right? Enough singing for me. It's like, yes, preacher, we got the idea. But it, but it saves you. It not only saves your soul, it saves you. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you, but it also, it, it also saves your soul. You're saved from the wrath to come. Now, that wrath has to do with the wrath and hell forever, but it also has to do with the wrath of the tribulation. I'm in Timothy. That's not going to help you any. First Thessalonians chapter number 5. I wanted to preach this to you this morning, but I didn't get around to it. Look in verse number... Oh, one to three there talks about the certainty of the Lord coming back. No second chance. The condition of people in verses four to eight that are there. Here it is, verse number nine. Here's the comfort. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The context of the passage right there has nothing to do with your soul. It has to do with you being taken out from the tribulation before the tribulation comes. That's what I mentioned this morning when I showed you that chart. We're pre-tribulation. Why? Based on this. It saves you from the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan and the wrath of the Lamb down here. You're not appointed to wrath. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say this, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we should be together, live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. How can I comfort myself if I know that I'm going to go through the tribulation? Right. He said the wrath that he's talking about saving you from there, the blood of Jesus Christ not only saves your soul, but it gives you a guaranteed ticket that before the tribulation comes, you're out of here. You say, really? Yeah, you're not going to get the wrath of God. You're not going to get the wrath of the Lamb. Hide us from the face of the wrath of the Lamb. You're not going to get the wrath of the devil. He, he's angry because he knows that his time is but a short time. Revelation chapter number 12. You're not going to get those things. You say, why? You've been saved from that. See, when you got saved, you didn't just get saved from hell, but he also saved you from wrath being poured out on you. And that's a pretty serious deal there. So what happens? The Lord does those, all those things to you from the blood. And for that young lady that asked that question, innocently so, and said, why is the blood so important to you? And why do you think it's not good for them to take it out of the Bible? That's the reason why. Because everything you got, you got because of the blood. Amen. Now, one of the brethren wants to say this, and I say that term loosely. I guess he's saved. I don't know if he is or not. If he doesn't believe that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, I don't know how. But what he teaches is, he teaches that it was the life of Christ that set him apart and therefore it was his death not the shedding of blood that saves you he teaches a bloodless painless thing so that if the Lord had hung off of a tree from by his neck and died or if the Lord had died in a car accident or something like that that he didn't have to shed his blood not according to what I gave you it was not his vicarious death it was the atonement through the blood of Jesus Christ that saved you 
It's important to get that. Don't let them talk you out of that. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Well, it was just his, uh, his uh, uh, separated life that he lived during his time as a ministry. Now you're starting to get into some real shaky stuff. Well, I believe Jesus Christ was a good man until he got baptized, and at his baptism he turned into God, but he wasn't always God. And then he got uh, uh, glorified at that moment, but then he wasn't glorified the minute that he went to the cross. Well, if he wasn't when he went on the cross, we're in trouble. You're getting too sophisticated for me. Jesus Christ came. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, right? He's born there in a manger. That's Luke chapter 2 when he says over there, you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and so on and so forth. was with the angel uh, 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 of hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace. But why? For the birth. That's God manifest in the flesh as a baby. He was God the entire time. He was God in the womb. So when they get all sophisticated with you and try to give you a time period, when did he turn into God and when was he God and then he wasn't God and then he is God? No, you just have both natures that are there. All right, maybe that'll give you a little bit of help about the blood, and uh, hopefully, Lord willing, it'll, it'll help you to, to do a little bit of study when it comes to the blood. You don't ever want to give up the blood, and you don't want a Bible that doesn't have the blood in it. Amen. In the old days, your Bibles, your Bibles didn't have gold. Now that's supposed to be for his sovereignty or his deity or something. But your Bible was black on the outside, and this is going back. This will be back in the days of my father-in-law and maybe Brother Bert and Brother Hako. Um, I'm, I'm seven minutes late, Brother Hako, but I, I got you coming. But in the old days, when you bought a Bible, the Bible uh, was black on the outside, and it had red around the edges, and that was for blood. Your flag even represents that if you take a good look at it. Blue would represent heaven, and red would represent the blood, and white would represent you after you've been through the blood that enables you to go to heaven. It's all around you. So without the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not cleansed. The fellow told me one time, I know nothing about photography, and everybody's got it on their phone now and stuff like that, but he said if you want something to come through white, you shoot it through a red lens. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe one of you photographers can tell me that, but some kind of special, sophisticated way, they shoot something through a red lens and it turns out white. Well, that's how the Lord sees you. He sees you through the blood. So when the devil goes up there, and he says, you see Peacock down there, look at him, look at what he did, look at what he said. And the Lord looks down through that blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and he said, well, he looks all right to me. You say, why? It sees me through the blood. All right, let's stand together and be dismissed.